we would like to zero in this week on the New Deal. We have talked much already about the varieties of reform in the history of the American empire and the history of American democracy. Uh, we, we do not in any way want to downplay the difficulty of trying to push through various kinds of reform, but we do want to highlight the limits, the severe limits of the institutional imagination of American elites when it comes to experiment, experimental in, engaging ex experimentalism regarding the basic institutions of America. And the best example is the grandest example in the history of the 20th century in America, the New Deal. We could argue there's three high moments of reform in the history of American democracy. The first, of course, is the Civil War. We'll say more about that in the coming weeks. The first time America has to mobilize on a national level a public army, public administration, public bureaucracy, and generates a whole new sense of what it is to be a nation, what it is to be a modern nation state with the end of that Civil War and the breaking the back of American slavery. Uh, the third would be the Great Society of Lyndon Baines Johnson, but the Great Society of Lyndon Baines Johnson was in many ways an extension of the framework of the New Deal. Uh, Frederick Franklin Delano Roosevelt and uh, Morgan Thal and Perkins and all the Brandeises and the others who played such an important role in setting in place what would constitute the touchstone for American liberalism, for American progressivism. And so this week we want to engage in a conversation about the New Deal. And I wish we had a chance to uh, assign various texts. I was just looking at this marvelous text by our dear sister Tamara Lothian, A Law and the Wealth of Nations, one of the finest, most sophisticated and subtle uh, treatments of the New Deal from the vantage point of political economy. And this is very important because you get a lot of discussions and uh, discourses about the New Deal, let's say, at our beloved Kennedy School. But you're not going to get a critique of its severe limitations that have to do with the deepening of democracy and contesting some of the hidden assumptions and tacit presuppositions of the basic institutional arrangements of American capitalism. So where do we begin? Think in your mind, 1929, unemployment rates 4%, 1933 is 25%. Boom. It makes 2008 and 2009 look small. And we know how big that catastrophe was just 10 years ago with the relative collapse of financial, of financial operations in American capitalism. This is a profound crisis. And we've seen Brother Roberto and Professor Unger put forward the claim that unfortunately, American elites have to depend on crisis before they engage in reformist imaginary projections. And one of the fundamental features of an alternative vision is not to have to depend on crises. But the collapse of Wall Street and the crash of Wall Street in 1929, not just here, but reverberations all around the world, generated unprecedented levels of social misery, unemployment, and here comes FDR. And what is he campaigning on vis-a-vis -vis Herbert Hoover? A balanced budget. Now, this is very important. Very important, FDR did not in any way begin as a progressive or a liberal regarding reform. It was the inability of Hoover to generate any kind of vision or enthusiasm given his tie to old style free market policies, old style laissez-faire capitalism in which roughly between 1877 and 1929 you had unprecedented prosperity produced Massive unequal distribution was no right of working people to engage in collective bargaining. Now, Lenin called it 
a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Now that's harsh. We know that uh, our communist brothers and sisters can be harsh in their rhetoric. But what he was saying, what, the, what he had in mind was the tremendous difficulty of workers being able to protect themselves given the rule of the robber barons who were generating unprecedented wealth and had hemorrhaged at the top. Now one of the greatest writers and figures, Mark Twain, the great empire imperialist, the great critic of capitalism and the finest comic writer in the history of this nation, only Nathaniel West comes close and he's a distant second even though he's a genius too. But Mark Twain called it the Gilded Age. So the Gilded Age is generating this unbelievable wealth inequality, unbelievable greed at the top, increasing misery among working and poor people, and then the collapse, and then the collapse. And the first wave of the New Deal in March of 1933 when FDR moves into office in the famous 100 days, the first 100 days. It's fundamentally about three pillars. It's about relief for working people, relief for poor people, which means the government must now intervene and provide massive relief. Already now stirrings of what we'd call the welfare state. That the government now has a responsibility, not just going to be the market as the sole source of response. The government has a responsibility of taking care of the elderly and unemployed, physically challenged, and children, and so forth. You, see. And you can imagine from the mainstream perspective, this looks like communism on the march. Relief. But the second is going to be regulation. Wall Street got us into trouble. There has to be some regulations in place in the name of public good, in the name of the common good. So you got relief, one pillar, regulation, another pillar, and then the third will be recovery. How will we attempt to save capitalism? How will we rescue our basic institutional arrangements given the unbelievable escalating poverty, suffering, running afoot in the country. Now, anytime you look at a moment of reform, there's a number of registers to keep in mind. And by registers, I mean different dimensions. I've highlighted so far the dimensions of the various elites already in place and of course, there's always elite conflict. Liberals, conservatives, right wings, left wing, and so forth, especially elected ones, but most importantly, the financial ones. But the next register is social movements. The pressure being brought to bear, not just on policies, because social movements are the agents as much of imagination and shattering limited institutional imagination among the elites as it is organizations, structures on the move, hitting the streets, going to jail, some of them dying, and therefore forcing the country to look at itself and to explore alternatives to what's in place given the colossal failure of the status quo in 1929, 30, 31, and with now the presence of FDR. So the first thing he does is he wants to provide relief. But he's still tied to a balanced budget. So what does he do? He comes up with a fascinating idea. He says, I believe in a balanced budget for the regular operations of the government but there's an emergency at work, so we're gonna have a budget for the emergency as well. Two tier, you call it the double budget. So that he convinces Morgenthau and the others, deeply conservative, tied to Wall Street. And this is very important because so much of the New Deal could be understood in terms of the dialectic between Morgenthau and Perkins. Morgenthau tied to fiscal conservatism, balanced budget, and that's always what capital at the top is concerned about because it allows for a 
possibility of not just a cutting of taxes and not just a matter of ensuring there's no extension of social programs, which are often viewed as unable to generate profits and therefore contribute to what they're after. But at the same time, it also shows that they're in the driver's seat. But then there's Perkins. Now, who's Perkins? So, so I should ask them, who is Frances Perkins? Somebody tell me who Frances Perkins is. She's not just the person who the secretary the, the housing of the Department of Labor, that's the name of the building there in Washington, D.C. Born here in New England, went to Mount Holyoke, studied at Columbia University, the first woman in the cabinet of any president. But she and Morgenthau are there with FDR every day for 12 years. She experienced the triangle shirts fire in Greenwich Village in 1911, where 123 women died. She saw it for herself in New York. She had served under FDR as his head commissioner of labor. She was fundamentally committed to social security, a communist socialist idea in the eyes of the mainstream. She was fundamentally committed to 40-hour work subversive notion. She's fundamentally committed to trade unions being protected legally so they could collectively bargain vis-a-vis -vis their bosses to create some kind of symmetry between capital and labor. Frances Perkins should be a household name in terms of her pushing FDR in one direction, Morgenthau in another. And Morgenthau's not alone. He had a whole host of other deeply conservative elites. Perkins was not alone. There was Eleanor Roosevelt, not just the wife of FDR, but the progressive wife of FDR, open critic of capitalism, open critic of Jim Crow. Eleanor, with Paul Robeson, Harry Belafonte, saying explicitly, honey, husband, you ought to be shame that your progressive policies are still reinforcing Jim Crow. He says, I have my hands tied because the Southern politicians, the elites from Jim Crow South are running the committees. They're part of my own Democratic Party. Every attempt to push through legislation must be deferential to their pro-Jim Crow perspective. That's why Social Security Act, one of the most important acts in the history of the 20th century, excluded two groups of workers. Who were they? Domestic maids. Over 75 percent of black women at that time, including my precious grandmother, was a domestic maid, uncovered by Social Security. What else? Agricultural laborers. The vast majority of agricultural laborers, black, vast majority of black men, agricultural laborers. The work of those southern politicians tied to Jim Crow, trying to pass through the lynching bill. FDR finally signs it in 1944, making lynching a federal crime held up by members of his own party. So when we talk about the New Deal, when we talk about the relation between relief, recovery, regulation, and the ways in which the vicious legacies of white supremacy, male supremacy still operating to Perkins, trying to highlight those particular issues. He, FDR having tremendous difficulty pushing it through Congress. And the result is what? The result is that first wave of the New Deal that did provide relief. We do not want to downplay the making available of resources of people who were wrestling with unbelievable poverty, especially boomtown overnight poverty, which is downward mobility, working people who had jobs who lost them, middle class people who experienced downward mobility, finding themselves on the streets and so forth. And the possibility of what? radical movements coming up with an analysis of their situation and then moving more and more either to the left or as you can imagine with Father Gofflin, 
Huey Long and others, right wing populists trying to zero in to give an account for your increasing social misery. First wave, 1933, about 1935. Major relief, on one hand, agricultural, the AAA, the Agricultural Acts, trying to target various kinds of programs for those non-industrial workers or those citizens who had jobs outside industrial cities. And then pushback, backlash. And what does Roosevelt do? He becomes more radical. He gives one of his favorite speeches. We will engage in bold and persistent experimentation and it's clear that the economic royalists of Wall Street are, 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 are upset. He says, they are my enemies. I welcome their enmity. Now, that's rare for any American president to say. I was waiting for Barack Obama to say that because he, he didn't say it. No. no, in his meeting with the Wall Street in March of 2008, he said, I stand between you and the pitchforks. I want to let you know I stand with you. I will protect you. And he did. Not one Wall Street executive went to jail. The exact opposite of what FDR said. You see. So FDR responding to a trade union movement that's radicalized more and more. He's responding to a black freedom movement where, 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 where black people are more and more radicalized, many of them joining the Communist Party, many of them joining the Socialist Party, and let's keep in mind what's going on at this time. Norman Thomas. I hope people know who Norman Thomas was. Phi Beta Kappa from Princeton, a student of Woodrow Wilson, a graduate of Union Theological Seminary, Presbyterian minister, lost his religious faith in East Harlem, became a socialist, and ran for the presidency at least four times, sometimes five or six. Hard to keep track of that, brother. Norman Thomas, head of the Socialist Party, building on the legacy of Eugene Debs, who was, of course, the hero of my dear brother Bernie Sanders. Bernie made a documentary on Eugene Debs. That's the tradition. John Dewey, with Norman Thomas, critical of the limits of the New Deal not going far enough in regard to democratizing finance, not going far enough in terms of trying to reorganize the way in which production takes place, not just intervening after the results of the production are put forward, what Professor Unger has been accenting throughout this class. That's what the Socialist Party was calling for. And the Communist Party is calling for revolution as they always do for the most part. He said, okay, we're we calling for revolution. We appreciate it. But your resist, their resistance, strong. Why not extend to domestic mason? Why not extend to agricultural laborers? Why do you defer to the white supremacists who are running the committees in Congress? Why do you defer to Jim Crow? Let's break the back of Jim Crow now. Sign the lynching bill now. And we won't even go into the wave of different riots and rebellions, increasing disorder. This is a moment of the society melting. If we understand an ice age as a historical moment in which there's massive callousness and indifference toward the vulnerable, the melting of an ice age is one in which, lo and behold, people have to look around and see the suffering that's always already been there and come to terms with it. And that's precisely what this was. Now, when FDR says, I want to engage in bold, persistent experimentation, there's a sense in which Norman Thomas and John Dewey and the early Ryan Ho Niebuhr and others say, let's see how bold your experimentation actually will be. And in that second wave, he says, watch me. Here comes the Wagner Act. What is the Wagner Act of 1935? The first time the government ensures that working people can not only 
engage legally in collective bargaining at the table with capital, but they have a right to unionize and the government will support that right to unionize. And boom town in a few years, trade unions expand quick. Now part of the problem there is what? Many, if not most of those unions are also racist and sexist. They are very important. And we should just add as a footnote, just for our Latin American brothers and sisters, that Argentina passed legislation to have their workers engage in collective bargaining with capital in the 1830s. So the United States is 100 years behind Argentina. And Argentina is not known for being on the cutting edge of social justice. But they were far ahead of the United States. That's the power of capital, the power of financial elites, the power of corporate elites. So you end up with a attempt to push the old style laissez-faire capitalism into a corporate liberalism that does embrace organized labor, that does provide relief, that does attempt to engage in recovery, but is still under the auspices of financial and corporate elites. They are still in the driver's seat. And FDR is very honest about this when he meets with the leftists and tells them, you all want to transform capitalism. You want to engage in fundamental transformation. I'm trying to save capitalism. I do not want to engage in fundamental transformation. I want reform. He's very honest about it. He is a corporate liberal. But that corporate liberalism does have some flexibility responding to the social movements on the street and especially with the, with the Wagner Act, that he is told over and over again by the conservative elites of his day, once you allow these workers to engage in massive unionization, you're going to have class struggle on your hands. You're going to have anarchy on your hands. And keep in mind, 1877, railroad strike, 1892, Pullman strike, 1911, Ludlow. In each one of those moments, working people are crushed either by Pinkertons, who are those who are hired as military people on behalf of the bosses. America has one of the most violent histories when it comes to the relation between labor and capital. And of course, very violent vis-a-vis -vis indigenous peoples and Mexicans, Latin Americans, and especially black folk. What, what I talked about last week, fundamental role of repression, violence, brute force. You see. And that's precisely where America's headed. You see. Wagner Act, second wave, very important. Social Security, 1935, that's Francis Perkins writing every word and handing it to FDR. Now, when you're Secretary of Labor and you've got a fundamental commitment to working people and poor people in their organized, institutionalized form and still pushing for relief for poor, the president has someone to listen to who's cutting radically against the grain of the dominant voices of most U.S. presidents. Because most U.S. presidents have been fundamentally committed to what? Stability. And stability is what? The reproduction of the status quo. To ensure that there's no major challenges. To push back any dissentants, any, any of those who would dissent from that. FDR playing both roles. Fascinating figure. Think about him in a wheelchair. The wonderful line that Jesse Jackson had in San Francisco, I recall, in 1984 when he said, I'd rather have FDR in a wheelchair than Ronald Reagan on a horse. <laughs> it's a beautiful line. Because of what he was saying was, here you get this brother from the ruling classes. Where does FDR go to school? Harvard College. Harvard College. 
Now, you don't expect revolutionaries to come out of Harvard. <laughs> Just the fact some of us try to be, but it's hard. Harvard, that Harvard influenced something else. So that legacy strong. <laughs> Got to fight it. <laughs> no, Du Bois came. We, we just got a number. Norman Mailer and a whole host of others come out of Harvard. It's a wonderful thing. But the point is this <laughs> FDR tied to the elites of Hyde Park in New York. You don't expect someone to commit that kind of class suicide against your best friends who you've been golfing with and sipping tea for decades. That's what he was willing to do. Not in the name of fundamental transformation, not in the name of democratizing finance, not in the name of trying to come up with new forms of, of production, but in the name of a reform that would tilt the system toward poor and working people within the narrow constraints of the basic arrangements. That's why FDR continues to cast a shadow almost 100 years years later, and that's a statement on the lack of institutional imagination of liberals and the left since FDR. What a statement. Now we know that the United States does not economically bounce back given the massive economic catastrophe of the Great Depression until the war, until the war. Because also as part of that second wave, U.S. Supreme Court will render unconstitutional the NRA, the National Recovery Act, other executive orders of the F F F FDR. You see. The fight back on the right begins to set in. Keep in mind, in 1939, one out of two Americans lived in poverty. It's hard to conceive. Another significant slice, near poverty. When they enacted the extension of the income tax, it primarily applied to one person in America. His name is John D. Rockefeller. That's how the wealth inequality tilted against poor and working people. And that's what so much of the challenge was in terms of those social movements on the streets trying to convince the country that it was headed toward a slippery slide to hell. But here comes the war, 1941 to 1945, the GNP quadruples. 1929, 3% of GNP went to federal funds by 1944, 40%. Why? Because under the war, national mobilization driven by government pushed toward full employment, women gaining access in patriarchal households because so many of the men were fighting, black folk gaining some significant access. And what did A. Philip Randolph threaten to do in 1941? He threatened a march on Washington if FDR did not sign an executive order that allowed black people to work in those facilities tied to war mobilization. And he had thousands and thousands of black and white and other folk willing to march. That's the same A. Philip Randolph who would also be the head of the March on Washington in August of 1963, 22 years later. That brother had longevity of integrity. 22 years later, he pulls off a march on Washington. This time, he's got a Negro preacher named Martin Luther King Jr. who's got a dream that he's going to tell America about. But in 1941, he had already met with FDR. FDR said, oh, no, you will be a traitor. We're, in, we're, we're fighting a war. No, we're going to deal with some white supremacist practices here. We're not calling for the end of Jim Crow. That's too radical for you. We understand that. And we know your wife is whispering in your ear every night. <laughs> Unsuccessfully. That's how love is sometimes. <laughs> but we're going to make sure these black folk have access to these jobs. 1941. Unbelievable economic expansion. The economic crisis is over. War did it. Another crisis again, as Professor Unger points out, that allows the country to somehow 
economically bounce back from the crash of 29. It does not deal with wealth inequality in a substantive way, but it does diminish wealth inequality. And that's important to point out. We want to be very uh, honest and candid with our liberal brothers and sisters who say, well, Professor West, you're always calling for something radical. Why don't you accent the degree to which wealth equality did diminish? Why? Because you had high income tax of 79% of those who made over $5 million. They're right. There was a diminishing of wealth inequality, but it was still huge even after the diminishment took place. So they're right, but not as substantially right as they would like to be. And they pass it on, the Truman Fair Deal. Eisenhower keeps it intact. Here comes Kennedy and Johnson with the great society extending with civil rights, and voting rights, and Medicaid and Medicare, steel, welfare state, no serious contestation or interrogation of the basic institutional arrangements, not even being able to generate mass employment of high quality under conditions not of war. Peacetime. Unemployment increasing, inflation becomes a preoccupation of the financial elites tied to Federal Reserve. So in our discussion of the New Deal, I just want us to keep in mind both the breakthroughs, we don't want to downplay that, but at the same time the severe limitations at the level of vision and imagination and at the level of execution. You see. Did the New Deal make America better in terms of its ability to speak to the plight of the vulnerable? I would say absolutely yes, in a limited way, no doubt. Was it enough? Hell no. How come? A whole host of various reasons. All these different forces contesting, conflicting, and FDR in the end, of course, dying in 40. 44 and 45, I forget what year he died. Did he die in 45? 45. He died in 45, he died in 44. And the, uh, the beginning of the, the war economy, which became a permanent economy even with the end of the war. It's no accident that between 1945 and 1947, when the great C.L.R. James came to the United States and got stuck on Ellis Island and wrote his great book on Melville, critical of the American American empire from the vantage point of the obsession with the whale and the unbelievable greed that was still in place. You had massive strikes between 1945 and 47 because it was clear with the end of the war they were going back to business as usual. And Taft Hartley hits in 1947. What is Taft Hartley? Undercutting the power of unions. Curtailing the power of unions because those trade unions were one of the few places where there was increasing multiracial coalition around issues of poverty. And with the Taft-Hartley of 47 and then on into the Smith Act of the early 50s, it ran out the communists and so many socialists and of course the uh, unbelievable hysteria of McCarthyism and anti-communist paranoia in the 50s, we're on to a very, very different moment. You have to wait until the 1960s until you get another kind of reawakening that you experienced in the 30s. But let me stop there and open it up for uh, questions or queries before Brother Roberto says what he wants to say. Do not hesitate. Yes, my dear sister. That's right. That's right. Well, what happened was that he began to use the presidency or the executive office as a source of a variety of executive orders that seemed to fall outside of the mechanisms of accountability as stipulated by the Constitution. 
and there's no doubt he pushed through as much as he could through legislation. In 1938, for example, there was a, back, a backlash and the, and the Republicans actually were victorious. And at the same time, he had opposition from conservative elements in his own party. So he, he went around the legislative process with these executive orders. And that does raise issues of separation of, of, of uh, checks and balances, the separation of, of powers and what have you. Uh, and the, the, the major issue was the, the National Recovery Act that I talked about that was declared unabashedly unconstitutional, which was in many ways a, uh, a blow for FDR and the Perkins and those who were, who were supporting him. Now, if in fact uh, those, let's say uh, uh, Norman Thomas, Norman Thomas was actually very critical of what he called early on executive powers running out of, uh, uh, running amok, what people later would call the imperial presidency, uh, that it had to be a matter of popular mobilization through legislation. And so you know, when, when people had, you, you see these cartoons of FDR as dictator, and he's compared to Mussolini in Italy or Hitler and Charles Lindbergh, for example, with the America First movement. America First, we're going to make America great again. That's Charles Lindbergh. I mean, Trump just a footnote, different kind of footnote, dangerous footnote in the White House. But Charles Lindbergh already laid out the vision. And he had already had deep alliances with, uh, with Nazis and neo-Nazis uh, in the 1920s and 30s, you see. Uh, but for him, Roosevelt was a dictator. And the, con and, 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 the, and the Supreme Court showed us to, that because he did it, go beyond his executive orders. You see. And as you can imagine, you know, those are very crucial issues. Those are very delicate issues when you have presidents uh, going to war, for example, you know, and, uh, uh, without any kind of accountability of Congress or the American people. That is unconstitutional, no matter who the president is. It could be Bar Obama in Libya. It could be... Nixon in Vietnam, it could be Kennedy in Vietnam, it could be Johnson in Vietnam or in Dominican Republic or in Grenada or Panama, all these invasions and so forth with no accountability at all. Those are unconstitutional acts. And, and I think one has in principle to uh, uh, have an allegiance to some constitutional rule. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the beginning of an answer to your question. So let me just compliment that answer. Sure, sure. And then we got uh, another hand. The, uh, the focus of the legal and constitutional debate in the United States mm -hmm. that came to a head in the contest over the New Deal programs uh, was the extent to which the Constitution should be read as entrenching a particular version of the market economy. And securing that version of the market economy against any governmental intervention. So uh, in American constitutional history, uh, that idea that there is a pre-political space that is sacrosanct that must be immunized against politics mm. goes under the name of Lochnerism because it was the Lochner decision about the constitutionality of minimum wage legislation. Uh, now, the progressive lawyers uh, attack this idea. They attack this idea that there is a pre-political market order which mm. exists somehow naturally and cannot be touched by the state. Uh, that was the focus of the constitutional conflict in the New Deal. But this is what's really strange. Uh, when so-called Lochnerism was overthrown as the predominant legal idea, you might think that this negative accomplishment would immediately lead to a second stage. And the second stage would be the exploration of alternative ways of organizing the market economy. 
because if there's no natural and sacrosanct organization of the market economy, the next step under democracy is to debate and contest which market economy do we want. Now that didn't happen. So this, the, and this is crucial to, to understanding both constitutional history and economic and political history. The, 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 the second step, which would be the step of a, a contest of alternative visions of the market economy, different ways of organizing the market economy, never emerged. And now, in retrospect, what we're able to see as the predominant legal characteristic of the New Deal is that a, a new body of public law, the law of the regulatory and redistributive state, manifest in tax law and in administrative law, was superimposed on a largely untransformed body of private law, the law of property and contract. So if this second stage that I described were to happen, the legal transformation couldn't have stopped there. There would be a new body of public law, but the creation of this new body of public law would have been accompanied or followed by the reinvention of private law. Because what is private law? The law of property and contract. It is the detailed legal and institutional organization of the market economy. The organization in law of economic decentralization. That's what didn't happen. Now, it's not just that it didn't happen in the United States. It didn't happen generally in the North Atlantic world. And that's the profound relation of the New Deal to the social democratic settlement of the mid-20th century, the last great institutional and ideological compromise in these rich North Atlantic democracies. Uh, you can understand it this way. The, the forces that uh, renounced that challenged the established organization of power and of production, gave up this challenge, and in return, as it were, for this renunciation, the state was allowed to acquire the power to regulate more intensively, to compensate for inequalities in the economy retrospectively by redistribution through tax and transfer, that is progressive taxation and social entitlements, and to manage the economy counter-cyclically through fiscal and monetary policy. The state acquired that power, but in return, as it were, for the acquisition of that power, the, any attempt to change the structure of either production or of power of the economy or of the state was abandoned. And it's that fundamental compromise that is reflected in the legal sequence that I just described. Now, the, the, the fundamental relation of that to the predicament today, not just of the United States, but of these societies, is that we now discover that all the fundamental problems of society require structural innovation in the organization of the economy and of the state. For example, the problem of the hierarchical segmentation of the economy, its division between very advanced and very backward sectors, the confinement of the knowledge economy to these insular vanguards. Uh, and we could go down a long list, or the relation of finance to the real economy. There is no significant structural problem that can be solved or even addressed within the limits of the social democratic compromise. So that's then, that's then the limit. So, and the, the legal vocabulary is simply the surface expression of this underlying compromise and of its limits. 
and I think on, on, at the level of the operation of powers. You take, for example, two of the major uh, innovations of FDR in regard to the market, the U.S. Security Exchange Commission and Glass-Steagall, you regulate speculative investment. That those regulatory agencies, if they were effective, this is the kind of thing that our dear sister Elizabeth Warren is deeply invested in, you see, because she is a very, very sincere progressive liberal, and she wants independent regulation of greedy Wall Street elites. And I, I mean, I like that about her. but that she's committed to that. But what happens when the regulatory institutions themselves become dominated and colonized by the very firm that they're supposed to be regulated? Or to just the abolition, like the Glass-Steagall, which was abolished in the 1990s under Clinton, uh, thanks to his neoliberal uh, uh, economic advisors and so forth, Brother Larry Summers and the other, the other smart uh, uh, economists of the day. They undermine that and allow Wall Street to unleash its speculative activities with the greed running amok that leads then toward a new crisis and the inability to somehow get them under the traditional regulation. So the very thing that FDR was pushing for in the 30s still appears to be very progressive because there ought to be some regulation. Elizabeth Warren is absolutely right about that. But when there's no effective regulation, and then the curtailing of the institutional imagination for structural innovation that Professor Unger is calling for, you end up with even more higher levels of unaccountability, unanswerability of the most powerful in the economic sphere at the very top to everyday working people and poor people. But there was another hand here before we move. Louder, please. That's a good question. I mean, one is that I'm always struck by the incredible creativity and imagination of the powerful to reproduce their power. It's amazing. Same is true with patriarchs. I mean, patriarchs have had a long, rich history of unbelievable imagination of reproducing patriarchal power with a smile. Or white supremacists. Oh, we're going to deal with racism. Don't you worry about that. Watch this program. And you keep track of the execution. You say, my God, this is just a new form of white supremacy being reproduced in the name of fighting white supremacy. How creative of you. So that we don't want to think that just by using creativity is moving in a progressive direction. No. One of the reasons why a grand institution like Harvard plays such a major role is you get some of the most imaginative, creative folk coming up with ways of reproducing the status quo. And they get paid well to do it. And they have access to resources to do it, and so forth and so on. So that when, when, when we're calling for creativity and imagination, we don't want ever to think that progressives have some monopoly on this. And these folk are uncreative. They're just locked into static and stationary perspectives. Not at all. Not at all. The managerial ideologies, the various ways in which new kinds of soul craft feed into the reproduction of status quo is taking place all the time. Every year, every decade, new paradigms, new frameworks of, of coming up with categories that obscure and hide and conceal the misery and the po poverty at work, not just here, but in places all around the world, in Asia and Africa and Latin America and so on. So in that sense, the tie the greed, which is true for all human beings. I mean, poor people got greedy proclivities like anybody else. Working people have poor proclivities like everybody else. They attempt to be creative, but they're locked into institutional constraints that are very tight, very tight. So it might be manifested in some music and some arts and so forth and so on, but they can't institutionalize it in terms of their power being executed, you see. But uh, that's a wonderful question because this issue 
of imagination and creativity is one that uh, is cuts across ideology. So I, th I think it's a it's a profound question that yeah. can be yeah. that can be viewed in another way as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just talking about the evolution of legal ideas, and the core of this classical legal conception that was attacked, but only partly attacked and deconstructed in the New Deal, as I said, mm. not totally undone or replaced. The core of it was the idea of property. And the, the property right was the paradigmatic right. It was the model for thinking about rights in general. So all of the powers that we exercise with respect to resources are collected in one right, property vested in one right holder, the owner. In his zone, the, the owner has complete discretion and he can disregard the claims of other people. If he steps one inch outside of that zone, he then becomes vulnerable to the claims that other can, can make. So mm. in, in its central conception, property viewed in this way is an alternative to dependence and interdependence. You accumulate property, greed, so as not to depend on people. And the, the, this is the mm. deep psychological and legal connection between the accumulation of things and the rarefication of society. Uh, and of course, none of that is reached in these 20th century debates. They stay far short of this because they're only at the level of the state on top, fixing things, attenuating the inequalities and insecurities of the market order rather than changing the market order itself. You have a question? You, that was just a comment then, huh? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, no. <laughs> we got people with questions here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they have comments also. Oh, yeah, that's it. Right. You I mean, regulation of media is a very dangerous kind of talk because it's already truncated. And usually the regulation has to do with the weakest voices, which would be for the most part left and progressive voices. So that that kind of, so that in that sense, I would be a little suspicious of that language, but how in fact you convince people not to consent to their own domination. That's the fundamental question that you're raising. That's a very deep question. How do people not pursue policies that undercut their own interests owing to, to symbols that convince them that somehow 
they're in solidarity with forces that are actually undercutting them. But, but we, we don't have time for a whole seminar here, though, brother. But I mean, we got a whole lot of voices here, though. We got questions. There, that. What we want to, what the sister here, yeah. Mm -hmm. His involvement in, oh yeah, executive, executive order again. <laughs> no, I think your point makes it very clear that when it came to his willingness to engage in such a racist, xenophobic form of outright state-based repression, that he was willing to do it follow through with it. There were critics, a few critics who did, the Albert Einsteins and the Paul Robesons and others, but most Americans went along with it too, so it isn't as if he's out there all by himself or with a few isolated Americans. You see. During wartime, you can imagine what it is to, uh, to scapegoat those people who look like the enemy, those people who supposedly are gonna be in solidarity with the enemy. Um, but that would be the same in some ways as his relative public silence on Jim Crow even though his wife is very critical of it, you see. But I mean, when it comes to the, 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 the camps for uh, fellow Japanese citizens, fellow human beings uh, of Japanese origin and so forth, that was consensus that he followed through on. But same would be true in terms of turning back the ships of Jews trying to get out of Jew-hating Europe, you see. And the relative silence of many of the uh, traditional elite secular Jews who were there, there was a massive march in October 1943 of Jews against the turning of those ships away. But who was there? Traditional rabbis, including Rabbi Abraham Joshua Hesher, who had just arrived here three years early, wasn't even a citizen yet. But those traditional rabbis were over against the establishment Jewish elites. And the Jewish establishment Jewish elites said, stay silent. And FDR wouldn't even come out and address the crowd. He sent Henry Wallace out. Henry Wallace didn't know what was going on. It was like he just showed up like a deer and, in lights, he said, and gave a speech that was ridiculous, had little to do with Jewish suffering and so forth. So the, you got these xenophobic elements being executed in various ways against Japanese and Jews and blacks and what have you under corporate liberalism, even given some of the progressive policies that are being put forward. Last, last, last question before, or you want to jump in? What do you think? No. You to go, go right ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, a complicated issue. You all raise an issue for a seminar and a colloquium in that way. But one is that, especially when it comes to Occupy, though, you have to first accent the degree to which repression was, was, was coming at that particular movement. It wasn't just a matter of the effects of a uh, liberal economic policy. In the streets, increasing more and more multiracial coordination of police departments tied to the U.S. State, and Pen State Department and Pentagon to ensure the suppression of the movement. So, I mean, so the issue of repression is not the sole factor, but it's always a very important factor. But if you try out some symbolic reform to try to steal the thunder and fire from those calling for something more fundamental, that is always in place. But there's conditions under which the movement increases. There's conditions under which it begins to, if not wane, become less less powerful. And then it's complicated with a black president, too, because black skin is associated with something that's progressive. It must be doing something tied 
to the weak and vulnerable because how could a black person somehow not be in solidarity with those who are suffering? And so you've got the complications of the ways in which race can be deployed from the top to downplay the suffering of policies with a black face as the visible agent who's promoting those policies, you see. And that was part of the complications, too. You had so many white progressives who didn't want to tell the truth about the underside of the Obama administration because they would be accused of being racist. And, and that's, you know, it's a tight road to walk, but you still have to engage in serious truth-telling in that regard. And the suppression of the Occupy movement under the Obama administration is a story yet to be told, though many Occupy activists already know the story. That's the beginnings of an answer to, you, to your question. Any last question of a sister, a woman? Uh, my dear brother, I, I'd love to call on you, but if there are another sister in the old, then we're going to call on you. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. Well, this was a moment in which you had the recuperation of the social gospel, the Walter Rauschen Bushes and others. When I talked about Ryan Hone Niebuhr, he was the greatest Christian theologian of that particular moment. His text, Moral Man and Immoral Society, in 1932, was published right at the very center of the Depression. Still remains the most important work in Christian ethics up to this very day. He was professor at Union Theological Seminary, which is the institutional site for the social gospel. These days it'd be liberation theology, those days the social gospel. And there was a whole wave of Christian activists who, who were deeply wedded to a critique of the New Deal as Christian socialists. A.J. Musty, M-O-S-T-E, is one of the great giants uh, uh, in this regard. There's a whole wave of others. And of course, Martin King was a member of the Intercollegiate Socialist Society uh, uh, when he was a student here at BU. It's no accident when Martin Luther King Jr. received a call that he'd won a Nobel Prize to say, give it to Norman Thomas before you give it to me. People say, who the hell is Norman Thomas? Go look at, they couldn't say internet, go check him out in the encyclopedia. Because I'm, that's my tradition, King said. So that during the 30s, that's where Thomas and the others were. There was a significant wave of Christian and Judaic figures uh, who were religious, and it's very difficult now in these days to think of that given the, the right-wing character of so much of American religion these days. But we should, I don't want to take so, all the time, I appreciate it. So this is a wonderful subject, the New Deal, mm. and uh, it's very important for us in this project here in the course, yeah. because yeah. It was the last great transformative moment mm. in American history. The last time there was an attempt at an institutional and ideological refoundation in the country. And we can see it, as I just suggested, as the American equivalent to the social democratic compromise in the North Atlantic world in the mid 20th century. So as we look back, that was the last light, the fading light. Mm. Mm. Uh, and we have to understand it. We have to understand it unsentimentally to see what it accomplished and uh, what it relinquished and situate ourselves in relation to it. So that's the spirit of the remarks that I'm now going to make uh, about the New Deal. I'm going to make some preliminary comments. Then I want to explore four moments in the evolution of the New Deal. And finally, in the third part of my intervention, uh, describe what I think are the lessons that we should learn for our transformative concerns. So first, just by way of preliminary, uh, the most profound thing that was ever said about the New Deal was the following, that all of Roosevelt's programs failed. 
but the New Deal as a whole was a success. Now, uh, how can that be? That's really a remark about the nature of transformation. We shouldn't think of a transformative project as a, a heap of particular technical solutions to discrete problems. That's the technocratic way of thinking about politics. It's not like that. It's like a, a, a current, a, a waterfall, going in a particular direction. It's, and what matters is the direction and the fecundity of the movement. So in any real transformation in history, uh, there are many instruments, many vehicles, many programs, all of which are flawed uh, and are partial functional equivalents to each other. And they are overcome and set aside and replaced. And in a sense, their flaws don't matter. What matters is the ability to create new movements. Say it's a mistake, it's imperfect, so then you do the next thing. Uh, and that's the real character of transformation. Uh, now, uh, in this description that I'm about to propose to you of the, of the New Deal, uh, I want to distinguish uh, four moments. There's an initial moment of early institutional experimentalism with a very specific and narrow focus. Then there was a second moment in which this focus, which was already narrow, narrowed even further and came to uh, emphasize the provision of antidotes to economic insecurity. Then there was a third moment, a remarkable moment, of the organization of the war economy. In the war, everything changed. And then there was a fourth moment, which persisted after the war, but was prepared already before the war, in which the focus became the popularization of consumption, the creation of a market in mass consumption goods. Uh, and something is excluded from this succession, the succession of these four moments, something that is immensely important to us now. And what is excluded is the focus on economic empowerment, on the enhancement of agency, on the ability to act, achieved through some transformation of the basic legal constitution of the market order. That's what was not done. Now, finally, still in these preliminary remarks, uh, I want to say something that connects this experience to the general character of, of, of transformation. The institutional presuppositions of the economy, of a market economy, are not created within the market economy. They are created outside the market economy, in politics and in thought. So politics and thought are the two great forces that either narrow or expand the terrain. When there's a crisis or when there's an innovation that comes from outside and that needs to be accommodated, the dominant tendency in every society is to respond to the crisis or accommodate the innovation in a way that diminishes the trauma to the ruling interests and the entrenched preconceptions. And that's what you could call the path of least resistance. The, the role of transformative practice and of transformative thought always is to create an alternative to the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance is never the only path. It's only the most probable path. 
or the easiest path. And uh, in understanding what happened and what didn't happen in the New Deal, that's what we have to remember. In many respects, it followed the path of least resistance, but there's an alternative to the path of least resistance, and the alternative to the path of least resistance is of great significance for us now. So then I come to the heart of my comments, uh, which is the, the, the succession of steps of the New Deal, the evolution of the New Deal. The first moment of the New Deal, corresponding to the first year and a half of Roosevelt's presidency, uh, is characterized by an attempt at institutional experimentation. As Roosevelt said famously, bold, persistent experimentation is what the country wants and needs. And he was genuinely open to experimentation and surrounded himself with a range of voices that he thought could help inspire this experimentation. Nevertheless, despite this sincere profession of faith in experimentalism, the actual programmatic content of the early experimentalism turned out to be quite narrow. And it had two specific focal points. The first focal point was the employment of jobless workers, workers who had been made jobless in, in mass by the Depression, their employment by the state. The government directly created jobs uh, through the Works Projects Administration. Uh, so there was then a drastic expansion of public investment the range of programs of the New Deal in this early stage was the single greatest source of investment in the whole world. And millions of people were employed. But they were employed in these transitory activities, organized ad hoc, to build particular things, to deal with the infrastructure of the country. Uh, with no thought that this activity of the work fronts would presage some lasting reorganization of the market economy. The second focal point of the early institutional experimentalism of the New Deal was concerted action, what we now call in the vocabulary of political science, corporatism. And the leader of the uh, National Recovery Administration, Hugh Johnson, said the heart of the New Deal is the principle of concerted action between business and labor under the supervision of government. So the point was not to create new economic agents or to democratize access to productive resources and opportunities. Uh, the aim was to orchestrate or manage competition. And the prime objective became not economic empowerment, but economic stabilization, the restabilization of the economy through this orchestrated action between business and labor operated by the government. Uh, now, it's remarkable. Now, it's, it's, it's remarkable because something that's shocking to all of us, to an American, is that if you, for example, consider the programmatic content of the Nazi dictatorship in the early years of the Hitler regime, it was very similar. It was the same thing. There were the 
exactly the two same emphases through the equivalent policy and institutional instruments, work fronts and manage competition. And now if we take a third example, let's take the example of the social teaching of the Catholic Church. The papal, the social encyclicals begin in the late 19th century, Herum Novarum, 1891, with a promise of rights. <coughs> with no institutional machinery, then the institutional machinery is proposed in the interwar period, uh, Pius XI, Quadragesimo Anno, and what is the institutional machinery? Corporatism, communitarian corporatism, from Roosevelt, from Hitler. It's the same idea. Uh, and then, of course, this idea was discredited so that the church later <coughs> gave up this institutional proposal and the papal encyclicals at the end of the 20th century revert to the situation of the encyclicals at the end of the 19th century. A promise of rights with no institutional machinery. They tried an institutional machinery and it was discredited. So what does, it, what does this show us about the early experimental? It shows us something remarkable and disquieting, which is the extent to which all these political forces and politicians are at the mercy of the available ideas. Why did they do this? Because those were the ideas that they knew. Those were the ideas that existed in this historical circumstance. It's not enough to want to change things if you don't know how. And it's a fundamental mistake uh, in political action to suppose that you'll have the ideas that you need when you want them. It turns out that the repertory of available institutional ideas is very inelastic and very hard to, to enlarge. Uh, thus the significance of an effort like the one that we're making here, because we're, we're focusing on the idea element. Now then comes the second moment of the New Deal, uh, in which the focus narrows. Uh, this corporatist project is abandoned or downsized. And some of its expressions are declared unconstitutional uh, in the United States. Uh, and what then t takes the forefront is a, a, a focus on the provision of antidotes to economic insecurity. The signal example of this is the social security program. But the same thing happens in the regulation of finance through the Glass-Steagall Act and the creation of federal deposit insurance. The focus is not on tightening the link between finance and the real economy or on democratizing access to, uh, to capital. The focus is on avoiding bank panics and economic insecurity in the domain of finance. Once again, the focus on antidotes to insecurity. Now, there's nothing wrong with providing antidotes to insecurity, but there's the following fundamental distinction. It's one thing to generate antidotes to insecurity as part of a larger project of democratizing access to productive resources and opportunities. And it's another thing to provide access, to, to provide antidotes to insecurity as an alternative to such a project. And what generally has happened in the progression of social democracy in the United States and in Europe is that the provision of antidotes to insecurity, rather than being a complement to something else, to this larger program, has become the program itself, the substitute for, for that other missing thing. Uh, 
Now, nevertheless, in this second stage, the, uh, the impulse to experiment with the institutions of the market economy did not disappear completely. It survived in certain sectors, and in particular in the organization of the housing market. So in the second period of the New Deal, there's still, as it were, an afterlife of the early institutional experimentalism, but narrowed to housing. Uh, and uh, in housing, we have first the maintenance of a high level of public investment to address a public need, housing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the mobilization of finance, the creation of a secondary mortgage market, which became in the United States the single most important source of liquid capital of the capital markets. Mm -hmm. And third, we have the invention of a series of novel institutional agents, the governor, governmentally supported enterprises, the GSEs, which are between the state and the market, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which were genuine novelties, examples of mm -hmm. institutional experimentation. That is a little example of reinventing the market on a small scale in a particular sector. Uh, now let me skip over for a moment the third moment, which is the moment of the war economy, and go straight ahead to the fourth moment, so I'll come back to the war economy later. So after the focus of institutional experimentation is narrowed, the succeeding focus becomes the popularization of consumption. And this already was prefigured earlier in the New Deal. I, I, I mentioned once, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was asked, what book would you most like to see in the hands of every Soviet child? And they thought he would answer the Holy Bible. But he answered the Sears Roebuck catalog. Because it was this idea that this was, that the, that the, <laughs> Instead of, instead of a, a property-owning democracy in which the, the economic agents would have stakes, there would be this popularization of consumption. And if you look ahead to what came later in the United States, then there's this dramatic evolution in the decades that led up to the financial and economic crisis of 2007, 2009. The Americans developed an economy based on mass consumption in the same historical period in which there developed in the United States a massively regressive redistribution of income and wealth, increasing inequality on a large scale. How was it possible to reconcile the violently regressive redistribution of wealth and income with the deepening of a market in mass consumption. Mass consumption requires the popularization of purchasing power. And part of the answer is that the ideal of a property-owning democracy was replaced by the practice of a kind of fake credit democracy, made possible in part by the overvaluation of the housing stock as collateral. Part of the background to this was the residual strategy of economic growth in the United States, easy money, administered by the central bank. And another part were the massive structural imbalances in the world economy. The American trade and capital deficits had as their reverse side the Chinese capital and trade surpluses. And each of these countries used the structural imbalances in the world economy as a way of evading the task of structural transformation at home. It was, as a, a, in a sense, the circumvention, the, the easy way out. Uh, now let me go back to the third moment, the war economy that I skipped over. So it was a, 
a remarkable interlude. So here's a country in which the dogma of the free market is supposedly married to the national identity. But in the war economy, the Americans discarded this dogma as if it were a mask that they never really believed in. Uh, and they, they then organized the economy on a completely different basis through a series of institutions that were created, like the War Production Board, mm -hmm. as a kind of free-floating, non-institutionalized, ongoing negotiation between the government and the big private firms. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an idea of the quantitative dimension of this operation, the size of military procurements in the first half of 1942 was greater than the total GDP of the United States in the whole of 1941. So this was a complete transformation of the economy mm -hmm. uh, in which two, two elements coincided. One element was a massive mobilization of resources directed by the federal government in the, in the war crisis. And the second element was radical innovation in running the economy. Now, I avoid the word institutional because although there were new organizations, this was left in an inorganic, relatively non-institutionalized form and treated as a kind of exception just for the purposes of wartime. So it's true, the whole spiritual climate was different. And now you allow me a digression for a moment on this point of the spiritual climate. Uh, uh, in all of the belligerent powers in the Second World War, are the last total war in the history of the world, the most total war. Uh, rates of suicide and depression fell precipitously in all of the belligerent powers, mm. including in Soviet Russia, where 22 million people died in the war, but they stopped killing themselves. They just killed other people in the war. Uh, so this, uh, this says something remarkable about who we are. We want to live for something greater than ourselves. And it's as if everyone were taken out of the rut of a small existence of this long littleness of life and attached to something bigger. And although there was this indescribable suffering, in some sense they were happier than they were in peacetime. So as soon as universal peace was reestablished in the world, the rates of suicide and depression again rose dramatically. So uh, this, is, this is to uh, concede that, uh, I suppose, making two points. One that was indeed an extraordinary period in which the, there are inclinations and possibilities change. Uh, but the second and larger point is that we're not what we seem to be. Uh, and that what we seem to be is what we manifest under certain conditions. Uh, so th the war economy could have been an inspiration for a reorganization of the economy in peacetime afterwards. Like imagine the project of a war economy without a war. But it wasn't treated that way. It was treated as an exception pertinent only to the circumstances of war and without any counterpart in peacetime. So this is related to a deep problem in political economy that ought to interest intensely the progressives. And I just want to signal it in the hope that we might discuss it at a later moment in the course. Uh, 
economic growth, socially inclusive economic growth, requires successive breakthroughs in the constraints on both the demand side and the supply side of the economy. And, those, and that process of successive breakthroughs has to be organized institutionally. So one way to approach this is to remind you of a famous quip of Henry Ford's. He said, I like to pay my workers well uh, so that they can buy my cars. Now, of course, there's a kind of joke because they could be paid well and they could use the money to buy the cars of his competitors or to buy something completely different from cars. But the intellectual interest of the joke is this, that we, we imagine in what sense there could be a contract in which the capitalists agree to pay the workers more and the workers then agree to buy more and then we have successive economic growth. We can't have that contract. There's no contractual solution to this problem. There's only an institutional solution. Uh, one way to think about a war economy is that a war economy is a kind of drastic, extreme simplification of the solution to this problem. Because the state appears on both the supply side and the demand side of this equation and ensures the successive breakthroughs of the constraints. And if we don't have those special conditions of war, then we have to imagine an institutional equivalent to that task. Uh, and that's one way of defining the project of a progressive political economy. Now, let me leave that remark in its speculative, undefined state in the, in the hope of returning to it later on. Uh, and just conclude with some observations about the lessons mm. that I think we might hope to derive from this experience of the New Deal for the task today, the task of thinking and the task of acting. So the first lesson is the the vital importance of these two tutelary forces that I call politics and thought in defining the level of transformation. The level of transformation does not result from spontaneous economic forces. It results from the political and intellectual context of the, intellect, of, of the economic events. So Franklin Roosevelt had as his allies uh, the greatest economic collapse that had happened in modern history, and then the most total war. He had both. He couldn't have had better allies than those two. Uh, and nevertheless, he had trouble. And uh, so one reason why he had trouble is that the constitutional arrangements of the United States had been established to give him trouble, not by accident, but by design. Mm -hmm. So there are two basic principles in the constitutional architecture of the American Republic. One is the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power. And uh, the second is the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. And the Americans think, to my mind mistakenly, that these two principles are naturally and necessarily related. They're not naturally and necessarily related. They're related by intention and by design. So one could have the liberal principle of fragmentation of power. The, liberal prin the fragmentation of power can result in impasse between the political branches of government. And then the question becomes, will the impasse be perpetuated or will there be a series of constitutional mechanisms to resolve the impasse quickly? For example, by early elections or by comprehensive programmatic plebiscites. The constitutional design of the United States is such uh, 
that the impasses are perpetuated. And this is the way in which politics is slowed down. So that's part of the political context, which explains the, 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 the narrowing or the defeat of the transformative impulse. But there's another part of the context, which is the ideas. That's the example I gave of the disturbing similarity of the institutional experiments in the United States under the German dictatorship, in the doctrine of the papal encyclicals, and so forth. Why? Because that's the doctrine. And, and we're in the hands of the doctrine until we have another doctrine. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's not easy to, to have or to reform these, these doctrines. The only way to create alternatives to what I call the path of least resistance is to fight simultaneously in politics and in thought. Mm -hmm. And in, the, in, in creating different ideas and in reorganizing politics and the state. Now, my second observation is this, about the lessons. So, we often think that the organization of an alliance, class alliance, a race alliance, is like a, a technical afterthought to a programmatic proposal. It's not like that. Every project, every transformative project in the world can be represented and must be represented simultaneously in these two registers. The register of a series of institutional changes and the register of a conception of alliances. So every powerful project creates its own constituency. It's not simply at the service of a Roosevelt hel helped to create his own constituency through these initiatives of the New Deal. And that was the last example in American history of a project that helped create a progressive majority, a majoritarian constituency in favor of transformation. We can't really call it, however, a transracial progressive majority. Because one of the compromises that Roosevelt accepted, or the pair of compromises, was the non-enforcement or non-development of the civil rights laws, especially in the South, and the non-enforcement of the labor laws, especially in the South. Uh, so we have there this Rooseveltian uh, majority constituency that suppresses the racial division in the United States. And then after it comes the integrationist orthodoxy that we discussed that separates out the race issue from the class issue. So the result is that neither before in the Rooseveltian period nor after in the period of this integrationist orthodoxy was there ever a way of connecting in practice race and class as the basis for a transracial progressive majority, an undone, an undone work of American democracy. Mm. Uh, now I come to my, my, my third remark about the lessons to be gained. And I, again, I'm going to begin this with a theoretical claim, which uh, is, will I hope be important in our subsequent discussions in the course. Uh, when we deal with inequality and exclusion, it is vital to make a distinction between two ways in which we can act. One way in which we can act is uh, by attempting to correct, to ameliorate the inequalities and exclusions generated in the economic order, retrospectively, through progressive taxation and redistributive social entitlements. So we don't challenge the economic order. We don't attempt to innovate in its constitutive arrangements. We come after it, and we correct what it has done. 
And the problem is that this uh, retrospective correction is very limited in what it can accomplish. It's not that it's uh, impotent or illegitimate. It has a legitimate and even indispensable role. But it's very limited because the further it goes, the more it deranges the established economic arrangements and incentives. The incentive to work, to save, to employ. Uh, and so it has an economic price that, as it were, fights with the market. And that is reflected in the conventional progressive rhetoric about a tension between equity and efficiency. What does it mean to refer to such attention? It just means to say that you're leaving the market order alone. And that then, then there's this contradiction between the market order and some attempt from outside of it to fight with it or to correct it. So the more fundamental form is the, is the form that, that attempts to change the arrangements that influence the primary distribution of advantage, the way the market works and generates through its working certain positions. That's much more fundamental. Uh, and everything that we can do retrospectively is accessory to what we can do that influences the primary distribution. Now, then what, we can, what can we say about the New Deal? You can say the New Deal was not just corrective redistribution. It did, to some extent, cross the bridge from the initiatives that are merely corrective, which is almost the entire limit of the subsequent progressivism in the United States and in Europe, to the interventions and the arrangements shaping the initial distribution. However, then comes a second contrast that we have to establish. With respect to these interventions in the original distribution, we have to distinguish between those that just narrowly attempt to mitigate economic insecurity and those that attempt positively to enhance economic empowerment, access to economic, to productive resources and opportunities. And the significance of the safeguards against insecurity is very different, as I suggested before, if it's simply a complement to these arrangements that democratize the economy, or, or if it's a substitute, a surrogate for such arrangements, as for the most part it was even in the New Deal. So uh, that then suggests the agenda, an agenda of progressive thinking and progressive politics, which is it must insist on the transformation that affects the original distribution, not just the secondary distribution. And with respect to that intervention regarding the original distribution, uh, it must not be focused narrowly on the provision of antidotes to in insecurity. Uh, it must have this other focus as well on the democratization of the market order, on the extension of access to productive resources and opportunities. And one of the forms of that project today is the widespread dissemination of the most advanced practice of production, the knowledge economy, to the whole of the country and to the whole of the production system. So there's a lot, we, we have a great deal to discuss and we shouldn't, uh, I think we should, continue this discussion in the, in, the, oh, got in the next class. But four and a half minutes for questions, comments. Do not hesitate. Yes, up, up next.
I'm not sure in what level, because one thing to say is the obvious thing, that they took doctrine seriously. And they spent a great deal of time forming a, a counter-hegemonic position conceptually in, in American politics. But at the same time, there's this formula of conservative statecraft to which I referred in another uh, class, which is that the conservatives in the United States combined material concessions to the moneyed interests with non-material concessions to the moneyless classes, the moral agenda. And uh, meanwhile, the progressives had no comprehensive economic project that could be a sequel to Roosevelt's and instead uh, devoted their attention to a series of divisive agendas with respect to the moral uh, contest in the United States, with respect to the relation between race and class, with respect to the treatment of the poor as separate from the broad working class majority of the country, and so forth. So this was a calamity. But uh, to my mind, there's nothing natural about this calamity. This was the result of a series of failures, uh, political failures, but also intellectual failures, failures of, failures of understanding. If they had understood better the significance and the limitations of the New Deal, they would have been less likely to make these failures. But just briefly, though, in regard to, to Reaganism, you got military Keynesianism, which is increased military spending. That was a continuity of a permanent war economy that goes back to Roosevelt. Then you got speed up at the marketplace, attack on unions, beginning with the air controllers and subsequent attacks. And then you got the scapegoating of the very poor. So you got the cutback on domestic programs. So you got deregulation, a tax on the union, but militarism increased so that the state itself did not, was not cut back. The state was only cut back in regard to helping right. the vulnerable. Yes, the but, state increased in terms of its government investment but, for military. Yeah. But, but Cornell, in yes. every domain, the mm -hmm. mistakes were made. So just mm -hmm. take this mm -hmm. example of the military. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, under the presidency of Richard Nixon, uh, a faction of the American elites decided that it was not convenient to have a conscript army. Because what would happen is what happened in the Vietnam War. If the, if, the children, if the children of the American professional and business class had to go fight and die in the wars, it would be harder to wage these wars. So they then instituted this mercenary army. Uh, which was a total contradiction to Republican ideals. And the progressives said nothing. The progressives accepted this, uh, this, this subversion of Republican institutions that had fateful consequences in the, in the later history of the Republic. So it's not as if there were just one big failure. It's as if there, were, there was in every domain a succession of failures that all reinforced one another. Now, I don't say that in a fatalistic spirit, on the contrary, because I think that a different understanding of this predicament all by itself begins to create transformative opportunities. One last question. Yes, go right ahead. A little louder, please. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. 
No, that's been a, a constant, I think, in, 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 in my own remarks about the centrality of a critique of empire. You know, William James wrote a wonderful essay right before he died called The Moral Equivalent of War. How do you marshal the energies of war into moral crusades against injustice, against poverty, against patriarchy, against capital, rule of, of capital over labor? Because going back to this issue of the ways in which the very aggressive proclivities of human beings as a species tends to bring out this connection with something bigger than oneself. You can almost call it a kind of a crypto-oceanic feeling to invoke uh, Freud and civilization as discontent. To be connected with something bigger does bring out something intense in human beings. The question is, what is that bigger? And imperialism and the fight against other nations has been one of the major means, and this is what William James is talking about in that essay right before, before he dies. And it's been a very, very difficult way of trying to marshal energies to fight against injustice, poverty, as opposed to immigrants or blacks or women or Jews or Arabs or Muslims or Palestinians or whatever, whatever a group is being demonized in that way. But you want to say something? No, no. It's, it's, I think I, I, what I do, you know, next class we're going to discuss the earlier the reform early traditions in the United States. But I think that one of the things we should do in the next class is to deepen this conversation that we began about the New Deal. Because I'm convinced that a reinterpretation of the New Deal would have immense value for oh, today. Absolutely. absolutely. We've got two questions right here. Just right quick. You, you very kind. Oh, Sister Joy, go right. We've got our dear sister from London. Go right ahead. What, what is it about? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear Yes. So we do, we do want to devote a class, right, Cornell, to the d discussion of American exceptionalism. Oh, yeah, yeah we're going to yeah. talk about American exceptionalism. But I don't and feel that I, we can, in 30 seconds, uh, address your issue. Yeah, no, it's Thank a powerful you. question. Yeah. See you next week. Continue your reading. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brother, that's rich, man.